John the 14th chapter, beginning at verse 12 and reading through verse number 18. And the word of the Lord today from the King James text reads, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Amen. John chapter 14, verses 12 through 18. If you bow your heads with me once again, Father, once again, God, we come before the throne of grace boldly, as the word of the Lord declares today, it is our privilege as children of God. We're so grateful, Lord, for the word of God. We're so grateful, Master, for the encouragement, the inspiration, the uplift that it offers us in troubled times. We're grateful, Lord, for the nourishment that it provides our soul. Lord, the preaching of the Word of God is a divine operation. It is so much more than merely a man occupying the sacred desk and presenting his thoughts, his opinions, his understanding of the Word of God. But if it is to be properly preached and delivered to the people of God, then the Word of the Lord must be anointed of the Holy Ghost. And for the Word of God to be anointed of the Holy Ghost, it must then be delivered by the Spirit of God to the messenger of God, and then through the messenger of God to the people of God. Anoint the lips of clay that would strive to deliver your Word this hour. Anoint the ear of every hearer, those in this place, those who are watching by reason of the Internet, Allow our hearts, our minds, our spirit today, O oh God, to be open that we might receive, not just hear, but receive the engrafted Word of God. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Praise the Lord. Boy, i got to tell you, a lot of people do not appreciate how important it is to understand context when you read the scriptures. And especially, not, not, uh, uh, not excluding the Gospels. Tommy, can you do me a favor and give me a pair of readers? I think they're in the room on my laptop. Uh, especially when you read the Gospels. You know, so many people grow up in churches and we're basically taught to read the Bible as though these words were dropped from heaven, you know, and they were just dropped down onto a page. And they have no greater context, you know. They, 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 what was done at the time when these things were written uh, doesn't really matter. It, it doesn't play in. The words speak for themselves. Hallelujah, <laughs> glory for God. Well, I got news for you. No, they don't. There are many times, thank you, there are many times when we read things in the Word of God and we cannot even begin to understand the full import of what we're reading if we do not understand as well the context of the times. What was happening at that time in human history? 
Israel, the people of God who had been promised the Holy Land, were living an occupied existence. There were foreigners who were governing their country. They were not independently governing their own country. Can you imagine today if we in America, uh, for instance, were in a situation where the Russians had come in and their soldiers were all over the place and they were controlling our country and all the rules and all the laws and all the mandates that uh, were part of our society came down from Moscow. Well, it's pretty much what's happening, but we won't go there. Amen. Can you imagine what it would be like if we were not a self-governed people? We have a nation. We have a country. We have all this land. We have all these properties. We have all these people. But we're not able to govern ourselves because our governance comes from a foreign source. That's what was going on. In biblical times, that was what was going on during the time of Christ. Herod sat as a king over the province of Palestine, over the province of Israel. You see, the Roman Empire did not always go in and simply occupy every country or annex every country and kind of bring it in under the general rule of the uh, Caesar. But they had different ways of approaching different countries and different places, especially as they related to their proximity to uh, Rome. And one of the ways that they would... Uh, rule over certain countries that they had dominated and taken control over, they would basically set up a king over that particular country. It's kind of like in modern times when you give away um, ambassadorships to your friends and to your donors and people who've given a lot of money. You know, if you wanted to reward somebody who had been especially good to you, to Caesar, then he would, he would award that man uh, the opportunity to sit as a king over one of his provinces. And this is what Herod was over the land of Israel. Herod was an arrogant man. He was a self-centered man, something of an egotist and a narcissist. Again, uh, very much like what we're seeing in America today. Herod loved to build things. Gee, that sounds like something we're familiar with today. He loved to have buildings. He loved to have structures. He loved to have all kinds of architectural uh, feats that could be attributed to him. And while Herod sat as king over Israel, now mind you, of course, Herod was not a true king over Israel. He was not of the household of David. He was not of the lineage of David. Therefore, he had no, no biblical right, no scriptural right, no spiritual right to the throne of Israel. And the Jewish people were oppressed and they were vexed by the fact that here we have our country, but we're not self-governing. We're not able to govern ourselves. We're not able to do everything as we believe things ought to be done. And we're not able to do everything uh, according to the scriptures and according to the plan of God. So the people of Israel were very much a vexed people. They were heavily taxed. They had to give one of the requirements of a semi-self-governing uh, kingdom, as Israel was, was that they had to pay tribute and they had to pay tax to Rome. So they were heavily taxed, and the taxmen, uh, the Roman taxmen were infamous for being crooked and for taking more than they should and requiring more than they should and for imprisoning people who uh, failed to pay their taxes as they ought to. This is why in the Word of God when you read about tax collectors they're spoken of in a very negative light. You know, the, there's a very negative attitude that is generally applied 
to tax collectors because those people uh, were politicians in biblical times and they were crooked as crooked could be. So Israel was very much under the heavy hand of Rome. The people of Israel were not a happy people. Now Herod did something in an effort to win the affections of the leadership of Israel in order to help keep the peace without the Roman soldiers having to swarm in and slaughter hundreds and thousands of people. He rebuilt the temple. Ah, well, don't you know you can pacify religious leaders by giving them what they want sometimes, can't you? Mm -hmm. Oh, you can get religious leaders to kind of go along with your political program no matter how crooked you are, no matter how foul you are. Just as long as you hand us something we want. Well, Herod rebuilt the temple. Not only did Herod rebuild the temple, however, but he rebuilt it even grander, even bigger than it had originally been built. You see, even in this time in human history, Israel was a place of great uh, curiosity. It was the home of the, Jerusalem was the home of the Jewish faith. It, there was a very heavy um, amount of tourism that went on in Israel. Many, many people from all over the world would frequently go to Israel. Part of it was a spiritual journey to go to the temple. Uh, sometimes it was just a historical journey. And so Herod wanted the temple to reflect himself and how grand he was. And what a great and benevolent leader he was. So he built the temple even grander, even bigger, so it could accommodate all these tourists who came from around the world. And so that, in effect, it would draw tourists. Well, we love tourists, don't we? Amen. Every state in the Union loves tourists. It doesn't matter if it's Nevada, Colorado, Texas, California. You see ads on TV sometimes trying to entice you to go and visit these other states. Well, why do they love tourism so much? Brings in money brings in tax dollars. When you stay at that motel and eat at that restaurant, you're paying sales tax. That's helping to support the local community. So you're bringing money in that otherwise would not be there, right? Mm -hmm. So therefore, tourism was a popular business. And Herod rebuilt the temple, but he built it even grander, uh, even greater than God's requirement. Well, first of all, I'm going to tell you a little secret. Uh, God don't need you doing him any favors. Right. If God said the temple was to be a certain dimension, I got news for you, honey. That temple was meant to be a certain dimension. But isn't it funny how... The Jewish leaders didn't seem to have such a fit over the fact that Herod went bigger. Right. Isn't it funny how the Jewish leaders didn't have too much of a problem with the fact that Herod went grander and fancier? Yeah, how often religious leaders seem to think they need to do God a favor. They need to do things bigger and better than God himself has designed that it was to be done. But see, according to the word of God, the temple was actually very much a practical place. It, it, it was not so much a place of grandeur as it was a place where God would meet with the high priest on an annual basis and where sacrifice was made on behalf of the nation of Israel. But Herod did this for Israel. He did this for the religious leaders and they paid him back handsomely with their obedience and with their subservience and with their cooperation. <sighs> that didn't always play out real well. Politics and religion don't make good bedfellows, amen. They don't mm -hmm. mix too well. Jesus was crucified because of the marriage of politics and religion. Right. The leadership in Israel compromised itself grotesquely in order to crucify the Lord of glory, all because they were mingling politics with religion.
When it came, when it was convenient, they would mingle their politics in, and uh, all of a sudden, an issue that was really a religious issue, that was really an issue uh, that the local magistrates and the local lawyers uh, could have handled, and the local judges could have handled, because it was a Jewish matter, not so much a Roman matter. And yet when the Jewish leaders would want to do something and they couldn't quite get Rome to go along with the program, all of a sudden they'd get real political. You remember when the Lord was standing before Pilate, how that they begin to cry out, We have no king but Caesar. Oh my, turn to politics real quick. I'm going to tell you something, folks. The circumstances, the situations, the way of life in Israel in biblical times was an oppressive, difficult way of life. The Jewish leaders were not behaving as the Jewish leaders ought to have. The temple was not genuinely functioning as the temple ought to have been functioning. The people of Israel had a country, but they were not self-governing. They were occupied and they were controlled by Rome. There was a lot going on that troubled the people of Israel. And I tell them the truth today. Jesus said in our primary text today, Verily, verily I say unto you, He that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father. He said the time is coming when this body, when this physical presence that you're able to behold today with your naked eye is no longer going to be before you, but it will be parked, as it were, beside the throne of God. It will be set aside for a period of time until I return, and it is necessary for you once again to be able to see me with your naked eye. And that thought was troubling. Most Jews were looking for the Messiah, but they were looking for the Messiah to be the answer to their political conundrum. They were looking for the Messiah to be the answer to their political struggle and their political woes. Jesus said, I've come to defeat a greater enemy than Rome. I've come to defeat sin. Hallelujah. I've come to defeat death. Well, considering the circumstances they were living under, that was not altogether what they wanted to hear. No, they wanted a political leader. They kept asking him over and over again, Lord, at this time, when will it be that your kingdom will come? When will it be that you will cast down the tyranny of Rome and establish your kingdom upon the earth? You see, that was the ultimate end that they were looking for and the Lord kept saying folks that's coming later that's coming later that's not on the table right now right now I got to deal with sin right now I got to deal with unbelief right now I've got to deal with death right now I've got to conquer these enemies that are eternal in nature not just temporal well that's why the Jewish leaders crucified him because he was not the kind of Messiah they were looking for. He was not providing them the answers that they were seeking. And now he's saying, before too long, I'm going to be leaving your field of vision and you'll no longer see me. He said, but, but I've got comforting words in these troubled times. Even in this dark circumstance, even under the tyranny of Rome, I still have comforting words for you. He said, number one, he said, you know the great and miraculous and powerful things that you've seen me do? He said, well, I've got news for you. You're going to be doing these same things. Not only are you going to be doing these same things, but you'll be doing greater things than these. Why? Because I will no longer physically be here. You see, by my ascending to the right hand of the throne of God, I'm going to be able then to return in the Spirit 
And instead of being one man doing one thing by, by the power of God operating through him, I'll be able to return in the spirit. I'll be able to dwell in you. And then I'll be able to do these things through you. So all of a sudden, instead of there being one divine agent in the world, the man Jesus Christ, there are going to be millions all of my believers, all of my followers, all of my disciples, you are going to become Christians. You're going to become Christ-like. You're going to be able to do things like you've seen me do. And not only do things like you've seen me do, but even greater things than you've seen me do. Well, I don't know about you, but that's a little comforting to me to know that just because Jesus is no longer going to be in my field of vision doesn't mean his power to heal and to save isn't still going to be present in the world. Hallelujah. And I'll tell you what else is comforting. The Lord said, greater works than these. Said, And don't think that what you'll be capable of doing is going to be confined to what you've seen me do. Wow, Lord, you mean you're going to do things through us? That you never did when you were with us. Yep. Exactly. Hallelujah. Now isn't that comforting? Doesn't that help you to say, well, if he's got to go away, then that's okay. Because look what he's promised. We're going to be doing similar things. We're going to be doing greater things. He goes on to say, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. Said, if you ask it, anything in my name, he didn't say, I'm going to pray and ask the Father to do it for you. He said, that will I do. Hallelujah. Well, what does that tell you? That tells you, Bill, that there isn't anything you can ask God to do that Jesus can't handle. Amen. Amen. There isn't anything you can ask the Lord for that Jesus cannot do. He goes on to say then in verse number 15, excuse me. Uh, yeah, verse 15, if ye love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, do what I have asked you to do. It's that simple. What were his commandments? Well, he said at one place, he said, this is my commandment, that ye love one another. That your joy may be full. Boy, I'm going to tell you, if there's anything that makes me laugh, it's how quick and easy people in the church can get all sissified and foolish and pansified and run off in a huff because they're mad at somebody else in the church. And oh, bless God, I'm just so mad at him. And they run off in a huff. Uh, got news for you, honey. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. Got news for you. I can love everybody in the church, whether I like them or I don't like them, whether I agree with them or I don't agree with them, whether I like what they do or like what they say, doesn't mean I don't love them any less. Tommy's been here the entire 18 years I've been in Dallas, and he can tell you we've had people in this church over the years. And, I mean, some of them have been real characters. Some of them have, have done some things and said some things and talked some ways that I would have much rather they not. And as a child of God, I believe they shouldn't have, to be honest with you. But do you know what, Johnny? There wasn't a thing in the world they ever said or did that made me stop loving them. Right. I've had people stab me so deep in the back that it's a miracle I can walk that my spine wasn't severed. And then sometime later, they came back to me and said, Pastor, I'm sorry I said this about you, or I'm sorry I did this. Or I'm, I mean, I've had people leave this church in such a huff accusing me of doing all kind of stuff and being all kind of stuff. Oh, he didn't do this right. He didn't handle that right. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, and they left in a huff. And we were going through some of the hardest experiences that I've ever been through in my entire ministry. Not just affirming ministry. My entire ministry. And I had people stab me right square in the back and start accusing me of foolishness. And... Johnny, you know, you just got to stand there and you just got to take it and you don't lash back at them. You don't yell back at them. You don't accuse them of things because they've hurt you, you know, like a, a you know what they say about a, 
wounded dog. You know, you, you, you get a wounded dog cornered, he's going to bite you no matter how nice the dog it is if he's wounded. Well, you see, as a child of God, I can't do that. When these people turned on me, when they suddenly were doing me dirty, do you know what I did? I still loved them. And if they wanted to come to church the next Sunday, I wouldn't have thought a thing in the world about it. Wouldn't have done, you know, said anything, done nothing. They'd have been welcome. You see, because Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I want to tell you something. Uh, when you cannot love the people of God in spite of their imperfections, in spite of difficulties, in spite of whatever little glitches and whatever little arguments and troubles you may have had with them, uh, you are not demonstrating your lack of your love for God's people. Oh my goodness. You're demonstrating your lack of love for God. Amen. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, what's his commandments? He said, love one another. That's not conditional. <clears throat> Doesn't mean that uh, if they treat you well, you love them back. And if they don't treat you well, you hate them. He said, no. He said, love your enemies. Am I telling the truth? There's another commandment. Love your enemies. Pray for them which spitefully use you. My goodness. Oh, I want to tell you today, folks. It saddens me that people uh, do not understand that there is a higher standard that God has called His people to than acting like a bunch of little cis fight babies and running, screaming, and hollering from the building. Well, it's my ball and I'm going home with it just because every conversation and every argument and every disagreement don't go your way. Right. That really troubles me. I'll tell you, this church today, before we would, there's no way in the world we'd be able to have meetings in this particular room if everybody acted like Christians ought to act. Am I telling the truth today? Jesus went on to say in our primary text, I'm trying to hurry today. He said, I'm going to ask the Father and He will give you another comforter. Another comforter that He may abide with you for how long? Forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not. Now, mind you, the Lord's talking about another comforter. He said, it's a spirit, right? It's not a person. It's a spirit. It's the spirit of truth. He said, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not. Well, Lord, what, what, hold on a minute, Lord. Wait a minute. You're kind of confusing me here a little bit. You're talking about a spirit, aren't you? Well, how in the world can the world not receive this spirit because it doesn't see the spirit? Nobody sees the spirit. <laughs> Why are you saying the world can't receive this spirit of truth? Because the world can't see this spirit. He goes on to say, see, Jesus often spoke in what almost amounted to code. And there was a reason for this, because it was meant to be understood by those who would strive to understand it. Those whose hearts and minds were open to revelation. Those whose hearts and minds were open to receiving from God an understanding of His words. Many times the Lord said things in such a way and he did it on purpose because this way the unbeliever and the unsaved and the world, they didn't have a clue what he was talking about. They'd stand there reading this bill and they'd be, well, what in the world is he talking about? I can't even understand what he's saying. And yet for us believers today, we read it and we're saying, I understand every word he's saying. Because listen, he said, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not neither knoweth him. But, I always say the biggest word in the Bible is but, B-U-T. But ye know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. He said the, the world can't receive him because the world can't see him. But you See him. How do you see him? Well, he's been dwelling with you. Who's been dwelling with him? He has. 
He said, but instead of dwelling merely with you, I'm going to dwell in you. Now he's talking about another comforter. He's not talking about another person. He's talking about another manifestation of himself. He then says in verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Hallelujah. Who is the comforter? Jesus. Hallelujah. But in spirit form. And in spirit form, he is referred to as the spirit of truth. Hallelujah. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Hallelujah. Jesus is the spirit of truth. Jesus is the spirit of God. Jesus is the Holy Ghost. Jesus is the Holy Spirit. It's not another person. It is another manifestation of himself. And that's why we want God, Jesus name, apostolic, tongue talking, holy rollers. Define God not as one God in three persons but as one God manifest as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But these are three manifestations of one God, not three persons of one God. Even as man is manifest in three ways, body, soul, and spirit. Johnny, your spirit is no less than Johnny. Your soul is no more nor less than Johnny. Your body is no less nor more than Johnny. If your body is lying in a coffin dead, and your spirit is in your soul, and your soul is alive, Johnny is still alive. Amen. Even though one out of three manifestations of Johnny is in the box. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? It's a matter of manifestations of God, not a matter of persons. That is why the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, For without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Listen, God was manifest in the flesh. He didn't say the second person of the Holy Trinity was revealed in the flesh. He said God was manifest in the flesh. So as oneness believers, we believe in the manifestation, the manifest, uh, manifestating, the term manifest or manifestation rather than the term persons. Because God is not three people. For God to be three people, he would have to be three deities. And we know from the word of God that God is one. Even the apostle Paul said, that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And then what did he say? He said, and these three are one. Not meaning they were united. Not meaning their unity. That is not what he means. He means, no, these are three manifestations of the one singular God. Amen. That's why the Word of God tells us that, please God, that all the fullness of the Godhead should dwell in Christ Jesus bodily. He was manifest in the flesh. Hallelujah. All right. Comfort in troubled times. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. I will leave physically, but I will return spiritually. In spirit form, I will be able to do things through you that you have seen me do as an example for you. But you will also be able to do things you never saw me do. I've heard stories, I've heard some wonderful stories over the years of miraculous, wonderful things that God has done through missionaries and through evangelists and preachers. I've heard some incredible uh, stories of missionaries going to very distant lands and very distant people and as they approach the riverbanks with all their gear and with all their stuff on their shoulders they had to walk for miles to get to these people 
And they approached the river banks and the river was flooded. And the local guide said, we cannot get across. Said this, the, the river was flowing rough and, and they said, believe me, it's way too deep at this hour. There's no way in the world we're going to get across. And Johnny, the missionaries, literally got in a circle on the river bank and they held hands and they prayed. They said, Jesus, you walked on the on the Sea of Galilee. If you could walk on the Sea of Galilee, then we could walk on this river. We're not trying to walk on this river so we can play Benny Hinn and do a dog and pony show for people. We're trying to reach people with the gospel. Help us, Lord. And they began holding hands. They began to step out into that water. And as they did, Tommy, their feet were buoyant. They were not sinking below the surface of the water. And this missionary literally walked across the top of the river. And this happened, folks, in the 20th century. This didn't happen in the 1st century. This happened in the 20th century. Jesus said, greater things than these shall you do. Said, you don't have to go to the Bible and find an example of where I did something. There are things that I didn't even do you'll be able to do. Hallelujah. I know missionaries who have gone to distant lands and the people in that land boasted that their demonic gods, because some of their people would literally become possessed of demons and they would be able to walk on coals of fire. And they looked at that old Christian missionary and said, when your God can match this, when your God can do this, then you talk to us about your God. And you know what that missionary did? He said, okay. And he kicked off his shoes. And he pulled off his socks. And he said, Lord, you said if I ask anything in your name, you'll do it for me. Hallelujah. You said greater works than these. You said we'll tread upon serpents. And if we drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm us. Lord, i got to show these people that you're the true God of heaven. And that missionary stepped out on that fire, brother, and began to walk across those coals of fire. And he stood out in the midst and said, now let me tell you about Jesus. And the people, the locals, fell to their knees immediately. Why? Because there was no gringo on the planet that had ever been able to stand on their fire. Well, no white man, no foreigner, no, nobody ever came in from the outside world and was able to do this. But Jesus said greater works than these. I'm here to tell you today, we're in a situation in our world, we're in a situation in our nation where things are getting crazier by the minute. I mean, things right now, folks, are growing lunatic crazy. We have a president who has been exonerated by the Senate, and now he is unchecked. He is doing the most corrupt things that any man could ever do because he knows he's got a free pass. He knows that the Senate will never hold him to account. They will never require him to abide by the law. And therefore, he is doing everything, anything he wants to do, any way he wants to do it. We have become, it is a fact, we're not becoming a banana republic. We have become a banana republic. That's the fact. Things don't look very bright right now. If the Republicans had their way, and to be frank and honest with you, I do not expect for one minute that this election is going to go off legitimately without a hitch. I don't believe for one minute it's going to happen. So I don't believe for one minute that the Democrats are going to win and there's going to be a peaceful transition of power like there's always been throughout the history of our country. Uh, that is not going to happen this time, folks. If you think it is, you're fooling yourself. It's not going to happen. Things are about to get extremely dangerous. Things are about to turn very, very ugly. I've been warning us locally of this for a very long time, and it's coming. It's coming fast and furious at us. We should be getting nervous. We should be getting afraid. But we're not! And why aren't we? Because we have comfort in troubled times. 
Jesus has promised you ain't got nothing to worry about. You're going to be able to do things that I never did. Hallelujah. You're going to be able to do things you've seen me do, but you're also going to be able to do things greater than you've seen me do. I'm going to take care of you. I'm not leaving you comfortless. Just because I'm physically leaving does not mean I'm leaving. Doesn't mean I'm leaving you alone. Hallelujah. The Word of God tells us in Matthew 1, and verse 23, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Jesus came so that God could be with us, but not just be with us, Johnny, while he was living his existence here on earth. No, but that he could be with us forever. Hallelujah. Wasn't a matter of God being with us just for 33 and a half years. No. He said, I'll send you another comforter that he may be with you forever. He said, there's another manifestation of myself that I'm going to share with you. And that manifestation will be with you. How often? How long? Forever. Always. Hallelujah. This was a prophecy uh, quoted by Matthew from Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. The word of the Lord prophesying, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name. Emmanuel. Hallelujah. When Jesus came, the message of the gospel became Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That was the message preached by John the Baptist. That was the message preached by Jesus. What were they saying? They were saying, Bill, no longer is the kingdom of God something that is afar off. Something that we merely look toward and hope for. They said, no, the kingdom of God is at hand. Hand. It's right here. It's in front of you. At hand means literally you can reach out and touch it. Hallelujah. If the kingdom of God is at hand, then the God of the kingdom must also be at hand. Hallelujah. Because you don't get to the kingdom without having access to the king. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. In Matthew 18 verse 20, Jesus said, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Oh, I want to tell you today, I've got comforting words and troubled times. He is here. As the old song says, hallelujah, he is here, amen. He is here, holy, holy. I will bless his name again. Glory to God. It don't take a whole lot. For Jesus to be present. He said, all you got to do is get two people together or more in my name and I am there. He didn't say you have to ask me to come. He said, I am there. Mm -hmm. Praise God. See why couples, it's important to keep the Lord as the center point of your relationship. You see why married couples, it's important to keep Jesus at the center of your marriage. Because when you do that, you keep the presence of the Lord ever present in your home. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise right. the name of the Lord. In Acts chapter 16, verses 22 through 26. And the multitude rose up together against them. And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Speaking of uh, Paul and Silas. And when they have laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. What did Jesus say? Where two or three are gathered together in my name. 
There am I in the midst of them. I got news for you. Paul and Silas weren't alone in that jail cell. <laughs> Hallelujah. They begin to pray and they begin to sing praises. And the prisoners heard them. And what was the reaction? And suddenly there was a great earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened. And everyone's bands were loosed. There's no reason to be fearful in these troubled times, folks, because God is still with us. Hallelujah. Jesus is still with us. He has promised us that because He is no longer physically here, He is operating through us and in us rather than operating as a singular man with us. Amen. Oh, I want to tell you today, it doesn't matter how bad things get, God is still able to open the prison doors. Amen. It doesn't matter how bad things get, God is still able to loosen the bands. Glory to God. In Matthew 28, 16 through 20, my final scripture today. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Didn't he say, if you love me, keep my commandments? He said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Listen, and lo, I am with you always. I am with you always. Always. Well, didn't he say he was going to send another comforter? Didn't that mean another person? No. Didn't mean another person. It meant another manifestation of himself. He said, Behold, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. I'm going to tell you, folks, we can see the end of the world coming. We can see this thing coming to a place where something's going to have to happen or we're just going to blow ourselves up and there's, there's not going to be anything left. The Word of God said, except the days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. In other words, God understands today that humanity will destroy every living thing on this planet if we're given enough time. God understands that. This thing is soon enough going to come to a close. This thing is soon enough going to come to a climax and a conclusion. Not too long down the road, Jesus the Christ will physically appear in the eastern sky. And the people of God are going to be gathered up together with him in the air. And we're going to ride out the second half of that tribulation period while the world goes through a period of judgment like it has never seen before. But I have comfort for you today in these troubled times. He's still with us. Amen. He's never left us. Hallelujah. He's still with us. He's still Emmanuel. God with us. Hallelujah. Yes. And He's with us. He's not Michael the Archangel. He's not the Son of God, a second person of the Holy Trinity. He is Jesus. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is, as Isaiah declares, a wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He is able to do whatever we might ask of Him that we need for Him to do. He said, anything you ask in my name, that will I do. That means he's able to do it. He doesn't have to go to somebody else and ask them to do it. Hallelujah. Oh, Danny, would you please do this for Johnny? Oh, Danny, would you please do this for Tommy? No. He said, if you ask it in my name, that will I do. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, there's comfort in troubled times. Aren't you glad today that the comforter has come? Amen. Aren't you glad today that we have Jesus? Amen.